So we're here to discuss uh, for our build literacy course on project two, and each of us chose an article, and now we're going to be discussing uh, about what is the big relevance of the article we have chosen. So Magda, what was the relevance of your article? So I was very interested in, I was a dual language teacher before, and I was very, and a coach also, and I was very interested in cognates and how how to use them in the classroom, like what were the strategies, how to use them in the classroom. And then, so I researched, you know, I put in cognates and there's a very interesting article on morphology and cognates pulled up. So then I, you know, that's what uh, was relevant for me, the use of cognates in the article. But then again, I learned about morphology. So uh, that's what, that's why I chose the article. Okay, great. And Rosa, how about your article? What was the big relevant one? My, my article was uh, based on the language transfer of phonemic awareness um, and vocabulary with kindergartners. And it talked about how if you begin with good receptive vocabulary um, in your L1 or, you know, like average language and average phonemic awareness, that is going to make a, a cross-linguistic transfer to your second language. And so if the students begin with a low, um, low language skills, then it's gonna reflect in their L2 and they're not gonna be able to do um, transfers. To me, that's very interesting because as Magda, I teach dual language right now. So I need to be conscious of my students L1 and develop it so when they, they develop their L2, it's on level, like, and, and it levels their playing field with everybody else. Uh, so I need to focus on the receptive vocabulary and their expressive vocabulary so they can develop their phonemic awareness and, you know, move on to reading and writing and all the good stuff in literacy. That's great. That's great. How about you, Cecilia? What was your article about and what was its relevance to you? So my, um, my article was on cross-linguistic transfer of, phon of phonological awareness and letter knowledge, um, but it was actually of a sample group of students in Kenya. So once I started reading it, I, it was really interesting to see how um, in their schools, they don't just focus, well, they focus on um, two languages, which would be um, English as a second or sometimes a third language. And um, how did, let me see. I could never pronounce it right. I kept saying it wrong. Like when I was reading it to myself, um, let me see. But there was another, there was like a main language that they spoke and then they had like their mother language. So I kind of, it kind of um, related to like indigenous people in Mexico, how they have like their language, like their indigenous language. And then they have like Spanish and English as other language that they learn. Um, so that was the case with um, with this sample group um, that they they were looking at um, like phonological awareness and letter knowledge with these students that might not just be doing um, not just be focusing on like an L1 and L2, but also incorporating that third language. And um, this was a uh, relevant to me like in the classroom because as a bilingual teacher um i we focus on spanish and english because of the location where where we teach um but there is sometimes students that come from other areas that are also going in with that um set of maybe three languages Okay, that's very interesting. Well, my article was about translanguaging and the writing of bilingual learners. And it, what they analyzed, and it was a case study of, um, of about five students. Uh, and it, through the article, it showed how bilingual students use self-regulation through translanguaging uh, as a process of uh, strategy uh, in the writing processes. So the idea uh, that I got from the article was that when teachers are sensible that the student has a dynamic 
uh, intertwined uh, linguistic repertoire uh, and they request a student to make a writing uh, production, they might first think in their their more dominant language first, they might jot down some words and all of this process of free writing, drafting may take both languages into action. So um, it's very interesting because they, they play samples of writings and it's clear on various ways in which uh, students will utilize both the languages uh, in their thinking process of um, writing. So one of the things that uh, I learned that I didn't know of was the terminology of the strategy of glossing. And what would that be? The glossing would be when the child or the student um, writes down a word that he may not be so comfortable in both languages and then later on this the same student will utilize that word that he wrote just to keep in the mind so i thought it was very interesting uh and through the samples we saw uh, um and drafting uh, of drawing with English words and then when when it was time to really write the paragraph or the sentence the child kept to the to the other language so and then uh, another one uh, student first wrote in one language the one he was more comfortable and then he rewrote it in the, the, the language that it was supposed to be written. So these are strategies which show that bilinguals, uh, they think dynamically, but they do have the ability to use self-regulation to, to separate in a way when they need to the language. So that was really interesting. And I think for classrooms, like in our reality, uh, it's just it brings up a reflection that the languages can't be set totally separated and that the children must be able and feel comfortable in the process of developing uh, any writing, um, uh, um, any writing task that they can they should feel comfortable in using their full linguistic repertoire. So that was pretty much what my my article suggested. And uh, it, and I think we all end up um, using and, and, and finding out more about cross linguistic transfers and how one language really goes into the others. Uh, Magda, if you could talk, talk about how Cognit and how your article, how, are, how do you think its implications into your teaching practices? How do you think that can impact? Well, it you? was very interesting, you know, to say, you know, that you that you see translanguaging in their students writing. So we have to be uh, very aware that students are using both languages in order to communicate orally or through their writing. And um, what I found interesting in mine was that we have to specifically teach students uh, some of the techniques that are in English or in Spanish are the same. How can they be the same and how are they different? So one of the things that my article was referring to was generational morphology. And it means like a common morphing, like the word heal you know, like he, one moment, because his dog is barking, let me let it out. Things we cannot control, and it's all, it's always okay. <laughs> have an English bulldog who's a baby. Okay, so um, anyway, the word heal, you know, like to heal someone, but then the word health, it's also heal, but it's pronounced health. So you can to specifically point sometimes that out to English language learners, you know, that, you know, span, I mean, English is so obscure sometimes and it has so many rules. So you have to point out some of these things. Well, you know, maybe it has the same root, like the root word, but it can mean a different things, you know? So another thing that, uh, that we do already, but it made me more aware of is to teach the affixes, the prefixes and the suffixes. And, and some of those are also the same thing in Spanish. So pointing out like, you know, some of it, it means the same thing, you know, like, you know, fullness or, you know, what it, what it means, what it means, you know, when it's in shun, what it means when, you know, in Italy. 
Um, and there also there are restrictions, you know, like I said, there are exceptions to the rule sometimes. So specifically teaching that. And 60% um, of English academic material is morphologically complex. So we have to be aware of that. And like I said, teach those things to the students. And teaching that der derivational awareness uh, is gonna contribute to their English words, their English vocabulary. And then that, and then specifically words that have the Spanish cognates are, they're gonna be easy to, you know, to, in, to uh, put in their writing or to enhance their oral abilities and their reading comprehension. So it all scaffolds onto one another. Like once they learn this and they can do this and then they could apply it to the reading comprehension, then they could apply it to their writing. So, and then it goes on to like, they improve fluency if they know the vocabulary word and how to say it and how to, you know, do things like that. So as far as in my classroom, of course, having a cognate wall is gonna be very helpful, but also not only having like the words and, you know, actually circling or underlining the stuff, but a picture, you know, to show, like having pictures also, of course, visuals always help the students and having, you know, my morphology also, my, what, you know, what my prefixes and my suffixes mean. And maybe even having, you know, like a notebook in their desk where they can refer to. So that's how I would yeah. apply what I learned in my classroom. Yeah, that's great. Some of uh, one of uh, one article that I read once about cognates, it uh, talked about how uh, de uh, depending on the pairs of languages, there will be benefits or not. And, and the extent of benefits will depend on the pairs of the languages. I myself have benefited not positively uh, due to cognates and also had negative effect due to cognates. So I think it's, it's interesting to be aware that the similarities between the languages can bring positive effects and negative effects. Negative. Yeah, like in science right now, you know, I, we read that, you know, they have positive effects because the Greek, you know, it derives from the Greek and it means the same thing. But I was watching a French film the other day and I understood some of it, but then some of it, you know, because she was an American learning French too, some of it was like, oh no, that's not what it means. Like you're saying, <laughs> so yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Anybody has anything to add up to our discussion? And it's, um, well, not strange, but it's kind of uh, funny that there's like false cognates that you would think like automatically would would be a cognate, right? And so then you kind of say confidently and it's, it's not what it means. That you know? happened to me when I was like seven. I lived in the U.S. and private it means do not see it's it's confidential in english so when i was back in brazil writing in portuguese i would write uh privada kind of like using this thinking that it would mean the same thing and my mom is like listen this means uh toilet this does not mean private i know it, uh -huh. it looks but you're not writing what you want to write. So definitely mm -hmm. says it works. And like yes. also, I found, for example, when I was younger, for example, science uh, in English begins with S and in Portuguese, ciencias is uh, with a C. So sometimes there will be some uh, um, spelling and orthography errors due to one language within the other. So definitely, I think the big thing is that teachers must be sensible, uh, but work through uh, so that the student does not uh, um, kind of like keeps such a uh, uh, error. So I think the big thing is, is establish objectives for your classroom. And I think that should be like an overall uh, um, district type of thing or whole school thing where uh, some things will be sense, will have sensibility to one point, but after certain grades, we would expect them not to make such mistakes. Yes. That's what we have been doing in our school, which is a, an enrichment program. So both languages are equally valued. And what we do is in the first years until they're in third grade, we are very sensible on, on hypothesis that they make due to the 
to to do to the both to both languages but after third grade we start polishing each language so they they really understand the spelling of each of them and how they work and it, it's been working we we see that uh from third grade on they're able to have less interference uh when worked uh, uh directly and and formally um onto that does anybody else want to add anything to our discussion? well i just wanted to say that in a way uh, with our English language learners, we have to show them or teach them or guide them on how to use their metacognition and use their thinking about, their thinking on language. Like you said, apply it to the writing with their language in their L1 and L2. Uh, also, when we're using cognates, they have to be thinking about the cognate and how are they gonna use it in their second language or how is it not going to be used in the second language or learning their vocabulary they're spelling, they're writing. So in a way, we're in charge of developing that metacognition of language. And um, it is very important that we're aware of all these things that you guys mentioned today, because that, that prepares us as educators to be, to know more and be better able to provide for them and not just, you know, like um, push them along, but not in a good um, way. I don't know if I'm explaining myself, but we need to be like very systematic, very explicit, um, uh, show them the connections in any way we can so they can continue developing that thinking, yeah. you know, of thinking about their language. Because even I, as an adult, I have to be thinking about my language constantly. Am I pronouncing the word correctly because I'm in my L2 right now? Uh, or um, in spelling or writing, it helps me a lot to use my L1, especially when I'm spelling, because I'm like, I'm phonetically sounding it out in Spanish, but that helps me spell it in English. I don't know if that makes sense to you guys, but um, I think um, developing that metacognition on all the literacy aspects helps our students become better language learners. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have a lot, whenever my students, you know, buddied up, you know, they're Spanish and English speakers, you know, they would, like you said, they would use their first language first and they would orally say it and then their partner would help them. This is how you say it in Spanish or this is how you say it in English. Now let's practice it orally. Like you said, a lot of practice, a lot of opportunity for them to orally so then they can um, use it in their writing or when they're reading it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Any applications that you learned uh, from your uh, research? In my case, I know that I have to be very conscious about developing language for my little ones. Like, uh, for example, the other day, they didn't know what a pañuelo was. So I had to go show them a, a, a Kleenex. This is a pañuelo. We're not going to say Kleenex anymore, pañuelo. And so I'm like constantly throwing new words for, to them to help them develop that oral language, that receptive oral language or vocabulary. Uh, because I know that's going to build them um, and that was going to help them succeed in their second language and the same thing with vocabulary for our we're learning letters so um, we, I want to go beyond the basic words like uh, sopa but we're doing, also doing like suéter, mm -hmm. um, suerte, things, words that they might not hear every day but that way their vocabulary is expanded. Yes. Uh -huh. So um, I just know that I need to be very conscious about teaching them language, lots of language, lots of vocabulary everywhere we go, uh, because that's going to benefit them in their L2. I used to carry around vocabulary cards with me, <laughs> and we went to their mm -hmm. restaurant or whatever we were doing. Like you said, I would introduce any vocabulary word with the picture, and then mm -hmm. you know, stuff like you said, they never had seen it or they never had heard it that way. Especially like right now when you said pañuelo. You know, pañuelo, in my case, in my house, my dad used it, you know, to, yeah, to, it's a handkerchief that he wore around his neck, you know? So it's the same thing as Kleenex kind of, but, you know, sometimes you could use it to, for your sweat or for different things, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also using, um, I know like, well, right now, cause we're, I think most of us are doing like virtual learning because of the whole situation. But um, like when we're, when we have them in the classroom to have, things labeled I know that's something that has always been done like so that they can see the vocabulary 
and slowly like start picking it up or that's a desk or es is un um, pizarrón or lo que sea, you know? Um, and I know that um, sometimes it might be put only in one language so that they could maybe transition from L1 to L2. But I think having both like the English and the Spanish or the other language available really helps them to think, okay, well, I know it in one language, that's how you say it in the other one. Especially those preview yeah. reviews, whenever you do those preview reviews, those are very important, you know, because you you're hearing it a little bit in another language or they're reviewing it, you know, so that would work. Yeah. And of course, you know, not only showing them the vocabulary, but like, tell it to me in a sentence, like use it in a sentence. Because yeah, like, using uh -huh. it into context is a big, big deal. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, anybody else? Um, like on mine, uh, the implications that I found with my classroom with, with relation to the article was how with the two languages that they were, they were um, touching on with the article, which were English and I didn't even say it this last time. Let me see. I'm going to say it this time. But I'm going to say it right. Um, Kiswahili. Kis so it's kind of like Swahili, but like Kiswahili, um, that they found that there was um, there was positive cross linguistic transfers um, as well as some negative. Um, and the ones that were more leaning more into the positive were um, the letter sound, I believe it was the letter sound. Um, but then there was a negative with the letter knowledge, like comparing the two the two languages uh, like written the, in, in its alphabetic form. And um, that related to my classroom because I know that it, with English and Spanish, um, it's kind of, I think, the opposite. Whereas um, Spanish and English, they tend to share very similar alphabet alphabets. So the letters do kind of transfer from one to the other. But then sounds do get a little tricky, especially with like I and E. They, they you know, they get confused with um, I, because in, in English it sounds this way, but then in Spanish it sounds like the other one. So that's something that, um, that's an implication that I connected to my classroom in trying to be very, not intentional, but very clear on those letter sounds with my um, EL students and with all the other students as well, because I know sometimes they, even if they aren't um, English language learners, they do still kind of get a little bit mixed up, especially at a, at, at a young age, like in kinder. Um, but really being um, clear on the sounds. And right now it's a little bit harder with um, like virtual that they can't see that well like the formations of the mouth and all that. But, you know, sometimes I get real close up into that camera to make sure that they can see that this is how you would form the sound for the I or the O or whichever letter it may be. Great. That's awesome. I think I have mentioned also what I believe that um, it's important for classroom action. And I, I myself don't have anything to add. Does anybody else have anything to add? I think we had a very good discussion. <laughs> Me too. I think it, it's <laughs> always very, uh, learning enhances the learning process when we exchange ideas and learn from each other. All right, guys, it was great discussing with you guys. So uh, Magda, you may stop recording. So